Hey, Southridge Church Online, my name is Matt. I'm gonna be your host here today. Thank you so much for taking time to come and meet with us here this morning. We are a church that's on a mission, and that mission is to see lives changed and fulfilled in Jesus. We are excited about the opportunity God has for each of us. We believe that taking steps towards Him is the way to go. So it is our hope and prayer that we all take one step closer to Jesus today. The other thing that's going on is I just want to draw your attention to a few of the events that are coming up. In all of this, go out to SouthridgeLife.com and check it out. There's lots of information out there about all of our events. But one of the neat ones is I Go Mission Trips. We are gearing up in 2021 for I Go Mission Trips. Back again, yes. So we've got one in March, there's, and there's a few local ones as well. So make sure that you get signed up and get prepared to go on mission for Jesus this year in 2021. The other thing that we're doing is Growth Track. Growth Track is all about who we are, what we're about, who you are, what you are about, what God designed you for specifically. So make sure that if you haven't gone through Growth Track, go through Growth Track. It's at both of our campuses and Papillion, one of our campuses, or, or uh, our campus in Pavilion, and our campus at New Hope on Sundays, the first, second, and third Sundays of the month. So make sure that you go out and just show up for either of them. No need to sign up or anything like that. Now we are in the message series, The Life of Jesus, that we've been going on. We're going to be talking about it all year, but this particular series is about the teachings of Jesus, and we are in session. So let's check it out. Well, hey, welcome uh, to another uh, installment edition. We're, we're not really sure what to call this thing, but uh, welcome back. We're glad you're here. If you're here for the very first time, uh, we really uh, are appreciative of you checking us out, kicking the tires, and hopefully you hear God. I mean, that's, that's really our prayer is that you would have an encounter with the creator of all things and, and make a difference in your life. And so hopefully that's happening. If you're a regular, welcome back. Glad to see you as well. Um, just want to give you a really quick word of encouragement. You know, this, this whole COVID-19 thing has been going on now. What, we're, we're coming into a year. Um, we've been doing this year, a year long of COVID pandemic. And, and you're probably just like me. It's kind of wearing. It's kind of tiring, you know, and you, you feel it, you know. And I just want to encourage you to, at this point, not give up, but actually hold on, press in, keep, keep pushing, keep going after it, especially in your spiritual life, especially in your relationship to God. Don't lose sight of the goal and the prize that Christ has for us. So I want to encourage you with that. Uh, let's pray. We're going to jump into the message. Father, I thank you once again for all the people that are participating online and just as you're stirring our hearts, God, to receive something from you. Lord, I pray today that our ears would be open, our hearts would be open, we would be ready to hear and receive from heaven. And Lord, may you receive all the glory. We give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today uh, we're continuing our study of the life of Jesus. Uh, we're doing it all year long. We, we're just going to keep diving in, diving in, diving into this idea of Jesus, especially in the book of Matthew. And, and really what we're doing is we're looking at what he said, what he did. I mean, some of the stories and kind of getting a, a feel for how he interacted with people. But I think more than that is this idea of what he desires for us, what he wants for us. And as I was praying and getting ready for today, I was thinking about a couple words. I was thinking about redirecting and redefining. I think Jesus, when it comes to interacting with him, he redefines who we are, and many times he redirects where we're going. And so hopefully that's part of this whole year, and especially this series, as we're tackling this idea of his teaching. So we're sitting at the feet of the ultimate teacher, Jesus. And so the teachings of Jesus, and this is where we get the title for the series, is our in session. And uh, so Jesus wants to give us a life lesson. Let's see what we can learn today. One of the reasons that Jesus stepped into humanity was that we might have this solid foundation to do life on. And, and it's actually part of our key text. And so check it out. It's Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus speaking. Here's what he said. He said, anyone who listens to my teachings, I'm going to come back to that thought in just a second, and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. This idea of his teachings and a solid foundation are part of this. Now, here's, here's what I was thinking about when I was looking at our key verse for today. There's a lot of opinions out there. 
I, th- I, I mean, especially now, politically, it seems like there's all kinds of opinions. And, and so <clears throat> there's all these different opinions claiming to have the right answer or the right perspective. But I think in, in this text, Jesus lays it all the line when he says, my teachings. In other words, he, he's not talking about a teaching. He's not talking about someone else's teaching, but he's talking about the foundational teaching of God himself coming alive in us. And it's actually echoed in another place in a statement that Jesus made. And he said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, he's making an exclusive claim that says, hey, it is my teaching that you're going to find this richness and and depth of meaning in who you're to be. And so that's what I think he's saying in this key text for us. Now, along with that, though, I think some of us struggle at times in life because we allow the opinions of others to give us direction instead of Jesus. In other words, we listen to what everybody else is saying instead of listening to him. We're not listening to the great teacher. We're not listening to the great master, if you will, the professor of life. And, and because of that, life gets a little messy. And, and so maybe today as we get going on this, you can just kind of say, Lord, I don't want to listen to all the opinions. I want to hear what you have to say and let you define and direct my life. And I think that's a big part of it. So today, we're going to be looking at another lesson from Jesus in Matthew 18, verses 1 through 10. So we're going to, we're going to just a second read the whole thing. But it's kind of interesting because Jesus is teaching his disciples about who is the greatest in the kingdom. Who's the greatest? Maybe you've heard this phrase, GOAT, you know, G-O-A-T, greatest of all time. You know, recently with the Super Bowl, we had these conversations about is Tom Brady the GOAT? You know, is he the greatest of all time? Or is it Joe Montana? Or is it somebody else? You know, Brett Favre or whatever. Brady probably has a pretty good chance to say he's the GOAT, right? So this greatest of all time, or maybe if you go to basketball, you know, is it Michael Jordan or is it Kobe or is it LeBron? I mean, I've been watching tennis lately, you know, is it Serena Williams? You know, uh, Serena Williams, is that who it is? But this idea of the greatest of all time. And so Jesus, he's speaking to his disciples as they ask him a question. And it's kind of interesting that they do this because they ask Jesus, Who's the greatest among them? I mean, it was kind of a selfish, weird kind of question, but Jesus responds. And see, as I was thinking about them asking the question, I think often the not so great side of the disciples would show through in their misunderstandings and their, and their motivations that were a little bit off. I think sometimes what happens is we ask a question or we make a statement and it reveals how we still have a ways to go in our learning and understanding what needs to happen. And that's what was going on with Jesus today with the interaction with the disciples. So Jesus uses their question as an opportunity to teach a life lesson or two or three or four or five. And actually, we're going to look at seven today. I mean, so he's teaching all these different things in these verses. So let's dive in. Let's dive in. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 10. It says, about that time, and whenever you see a phrase like that where it says, therefore, about that time, you always kind of got to go, well, what is the time frame? And, and really, you have to look at chapter 17 to understand that phrase, because in chapter 17, Jesus uh, has this transfiguration moment where they see his glory and his power, a handful of his disciples do. There's, there's this question about uh, power and and, and casting out demons. And I mean, all kinds of different things are happening. And it kind of set this question up a little bit. All right. So you got to, that's what's going on. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, it's kind of an interesting question because you kind of got to figure out why, why and where they're coming from in this. Really what they were saying is who's going to have the greatest power? Because in their minds, they thought Jesus was going to become a, like an earthly president, like an earthly king, a, a messianic you know, empire you know, kind of thing. And they wanted to be next in line. You know, We're going to be part of your cabinet, right? We're going to be part of your team, your posse. So who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to get the highest place? Who's going to have the greatest influence? And who's going to be in charge? And here's what happened. They had become so focused on his crown that they actually missed his cross. Because Jesus kept talking about, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to die. But they couldn't see that. All they could see was this idea of him being the king and them being in these power positions. So it was kind of a crazy question in the first, in the first place. Verse 2, Jesus called a little child to, them, to him and put the child among him. Jesus was always teaching with illustration. 
Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, and this is actually, I think, the key verse for the whole text. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5, and anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Did a little research, just trivia here. The millstone was the one that an, a, a donkey or horses would actually pull around to grind. It's like a huge stone. It wasn't like this little tiny weight or something. It was like a massive. So the, the emphaticness of his statement is pretty big here. All right. So it goes on, verse 7, what sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin? Temptations are inevitable. In other words, there's always going to be stuff that is going to try to distract you and pull you away, right? That's what he's saying. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, and this is kind of crazy. Cut it off and throw it away. You know, and, and by the way, this is more of an emphatic statement to try to get us to understand the importance of this versus, hey, I'm asking you all to cut off your hands and poke out your eyes and stuff like that. So it's not, not this literal sense. It's this idea that, hey, this is dramatic. It's important. Okay? He goes, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire fire with both your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better to enter, enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. I mean, again, Jesus doesn't pull any punches, right? And then the last verse, and this one's kind of interesting in this little text, context of where we're at. He says, beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. That little last phrase is kind of interesting because you think about, wait a minute, they have angels? And, you know, and here's, here's a spiritual concept. is There's hundreds of thousands of angels, and we all have these angels. I don't know if you could draw from this one text of Scripture that we all have one guardian angel. More so, the angels are in charge to bring guard, if you will, over all of us. And, and so there's this very personal idea, but a very global, huge kingdom idea at the same time. So anyway, enough said. So today, what I want to do is I want to look at seven characteristics of who's the greatest in the kingdom. In other words, I want to, I want to break down what Jesus said and see if we can't just learn to what, what, is it, what does it mean for us to be great in the kingdom? What does it mean to truly be great? And again, I think we'll find out that it's a lot different than what we might think. And Jesus is redirecting, he's redefining what it looks like. And so let's just dive in. And there's seven of them, seven characteristics, characteristics of who's the greatest in the kingdom. The first one, number one, is greatness comes from turning. Jesus starts out this conversation, he says, unless you turn from your sins. Which is interesting because one of the first thoughts that Jesus actually presented when he stepped into humanity and his ministry is he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, this idea that I've got to turn from anything that's sinful and turn towards righteousness. In other words, I'm never going to really truly experience greatness. Let me break it down this way. See, sin separates and destroys. Always does. It, it, there's no other way you can define it. It always brings about death. It, it, it tears down. It, it never builds up. And so I can't expect to have this greatness in life if I've got this sinful behavior that's taking place all the time. Those two things don't mix together. It just doesn't happen. The idea that I can be great in the kingdom and maintain any kind of lifestyle that is contrary to the king himself is actually foolishness. And I think Jesus is really starting out right there. He's saying, hey, you want to be great in the kingdom? You have to first and foremost understand you've got to turn from the sinfulness that's in your own life and turn towards the righteousness that's in God. In other words, he's redirecting, he's redirecting. See, greatness in the kingdom of God is always connected to change or repentance. 
You know, I, I think a lot of times we're, we're resistant to change. You know, we're, I've always been doing it this way. But, but Jesus said, hey, you know what? If you're going to really find greatness, sometimes you've got to just turn. Sometimes you've got to go in a different direction. You've got to find a new way. And he's talking about that, I think. So I'm not trying to, and really I think also it means, I'm not trying to justify or rationalize my behavior. I'm actually turning from it so that I might go towards what he has for me. See, and this is, I think, you know, I'm trying to slow down so I make sure I say this correctly. See, greatness recognizes my own brokenness and turns. See, see, I think the, the, the key starting point for understanding greatness in our lives is that we realize, man, I'm broken. And the only way I can find anything that's worthwhile is I've got to recognize that and I've got to turn from that and turn towards him. That's number one. Step number or characteristic number one. Number two is greatness comes from becoming, becoming. It's active, it's active. Notice what it says. It says, it, Jesus said that you become like little children, that, that something would happen, right? See, greatness is not with those who have achieved some great title. It's actually for those who have great trust. They've developed trust like a child, right? And, and, and really, if you think about a child, what, what's some of the characteristics? It's trust, it's, it's innocence, it's dependence, it's all these things. And Jesus is saying, hey, you need to become like him. You need to become like this child. The more I trust God to do what only he can do, I become great in the kingdom of God. The, the more innocent I am, I become great in the kingdom. See, greatness with God is allowing him to shape and mold us into, the, into what he created us to be. In other words, what I'm doing as a child, I just say, I trust you. <laughs> I, here's, here's my life. I mean, little, little kids just trust their parents. They just trust their mom and dad, right? They're like, here, you lead me. You tell me where to go. I, I got it, especially as a little child. In my mind, that, that child that Jesus pulled into his lap was probably like a six, seven, eight-year-old, you know, just this little child. And, and, and that's the characteristic that they're becoming. Now, now here's, here's something I think is important with this is becoming also carries with it this idea that we never arrive. So if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you want to be great in relationship to what God has for you, there needs to be something in you that realizes, you know what, I'm never going to be quite there until eternity actually starts for me. In other words, it's always in process. It's always I'm becoming more and more like a child. I'm becoming more and more established in trust and innocence and all these different things that we just talked about. So I think that's very important. Number three, number three, is greatness comes from humbling, from humbling, uh, humbling. <laughs> so here's what it says. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Again, I think this is the most important part or verse in the whole context of what we're reading, verse 4, is this idea that, of humbleness and, and, and bowing down. The word humble actually means to bow down. It means to, to get low. It, it, it means to not make yourself of something, right? It's I'm bowing low. I'm submitting myself to this. See, the greatest in the kingdom is the one who is most humble. See, because less is more in the kingdom. And the bigger I try to become in my own eyes, the smaller I actually become in the kingdom. See, Jesus is teaching that greatness in the kingdom is all about becoming less, not more. It's actually this oxymoron. If you want to really become somebody in the kingdom, you've got to become less. In other words, it's got to become more of him and less of me. I've got to humble myself. I've got to bow low. I'm not going to try to promote myself and lift myself up. Just the opposite. And here's kind of maybe how the statement needs to be said is that self-promotion results in demotion in the kingdom. When, whenever I get to the point where I think, man, I'm going to promote myself or I'm going to go after this, I've totally stepped outside the kingdom idea of humility and humbleness and bowing down. <laughs> Here's what I was thinking. I was reading the, the word humble, just kind of going over it, and I was thinking, you know what? There's no I in humble, but there is a he. <laughs> you know, there's an H and an E. <laughs> there's no I. There's no, there's no independence. It's, it's me bowing down and being connected to him in this. Here, here's another thought. Is that pride and arrogance, and actually, you know, if, if we put another A word in there, ambition that's not in line with God is actually the opposite of greatness. It's the opposite. See, one last thought, and we'll move on to the next one, is that humility 
is a very hard thing to learn, but it is a desperately needed thing in our lives. I mean, it's one of those things that I've got, I've got to learn how I can become like this little child and humble myself in life. That's where greatness is at. And it's kind of interesting because here's the disciples. They're saying, hey, who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the one in charge? And Jesus is like, you know what? It's just the opposite. Who's going to be the most humble? Who, who's going to be the one that bows the lowest? And, and if you think about Jesus' life, what was he constantly doing? He was serving. He was washing feet. I mean, he was doing all those things that was embodying this idea of humbleness, even to the cross. Big idea. So here's number four. Number four is that greatness comes from welcoming, from welcoming. Jesus said, and anyone, <clears throat> excuse me, who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. Other versions say receiving. Anyone who receives this little child is receiving me. It's, it's an idea of welcoming. See, the greatest welcome and don't push away. In other words, they embrace, not, not avoid. They, it's, it's not this idea that I'm going to just kind of do my thing and go my way. Just the opposite. I'm going to embrace the very heartbeat of what God's doing. What God's doing. God welcomes those that are maybe vulnerable and maybe in a difficult spot, unprotected like a child. That's what I'm going to do. And in doing so, I actually welcome Christ. I actually am really close to Christ in doing that. Now, <clears throat> The moment we make it about ourselves and our comforts and our convenience, we actually remove ourselves from the greatness. And, and, the act, and, and the opposite actually happens. And we place ourselves in a position of judgment. And I'm not going to get into the judgment, the millstone thing and all those kind of things. And really, that's what he's talking about. The, the moment you, you push things away and you're not part of who I am and what I'm doing is the moment that we're not great. We're actually in opposition. <laughs> we're, we're coming against. We're fighting against those things that God is for. So this idea of welcoming. Greatness comes when we open the doors in life and not when we slam them shut. When we make room for compassion. When we, when we make room for the hurting when we make room for the unprotected, when we make room for the vulnerable, see the greatest always, <laughs> picture this, have their arms open. See the greatest always reflect the very nature of Christ on the cross. I'm welcoming, I'm, I'm willing to do this. And think about it, just the opposite, it's not a clenched fist. I'm, I'm not at war with everybody, I'm actually in a position where I'm welcoming. That's greatness. I think that's where Jesus is kind of pointing here. So that's number four. Number five is that greatness comes from encouraging, encouraging. It says, but if you cause one of these little ones who trusted me to fall into sin, and it goes on, he says, it's not going to go well, right? That's where he says, hey, you know, if, if you do this, you know, but really as I read the, between the lines of that text, I, I kind of hear this thought that comes from Jesus that you should be an encouraging person. That you should, you should have this greatness characteristic about you that encourages, because those who are great encourage, they don't discourage. They don't, they don't cause people to stumble, they actually cause people to be built up. See, everyone needs and wants to be encouraged. I, I don't know anybody that doesn't. I, I, I don't know anybody that would honestly say, I don't, I don't like to be encouraged. You know, if they do, I don't know what's going on with them in the first place. If something's broke, I guess. But, but I think normal, everyday people love to be encouraged. No one wants to be discouraged, right? And Jesus is saying, if you want to be great, be a person who removes the obstacles instead of putting them up. Instead of causing temptation or causing a problem or causing an issue, you're always working really hard, greatness, to make sure that they can find exactly where God wants them to be. You're going through that effort. You're actually going to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, which, is, which is, sounds really simple to say. It. It's like you say that thing and you're like, oh, okay. But I think it goes back to just how we interact with people sometimes. I think sometimes we don't think about, am I encouraging this person right now or am I discouraging them? Am I building them up or am I tearing them down? And, and I know I'm guilty too. I mean, sometimes I'm not the best at this, but I know that's what it means to be great, to have this encouraging attitude about who we are. So that's number five. Number six is that greatness comes from considering. <clears throat> Excuse me, considering. So you got all these different words, turning, becoming, humbling, welcoming, encouraging, 
considering. So it's kind of interesting that in the middle of this discourse that Jesus has regarding their question, who's the greatest, he really kind of gets into the weeds, if you will, of considering where you're going and what you're doing. Considering it. So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, he says if your eye does, you know, he kind of gets into this whole thing. And really I think what he's saying to them is this, the greatest in the kingdom consider what needs to be cut away and and actually has the boldness to do it. In other words, I don't just like, well, I got a problem here. They actually do something about it. They realize and consider these things. Greatness considers the direction and impact of my life. Greatness considers, am I helping or hurting? Am I aligning with the angels of heaven (laughs) or am I contradicting them? See, those who are great in the kingdom of heaven consider what they are doing and how they are doing it so that they might be in agreement with God. So here's, here's, I think, the challenge for you and I in this. I think in this considering one, this one's the hard one, because i got to step back, and i got to reflect, and i got to maybe listen or maybe see things. And if you're like me, sometimes that's hard to do because we get so ingrained in what we do on a regular basis, we don't consider that maybe <laughs> this is keeping me from greatness. We don't consider that maybe what I'm watching on TV or maybe what I see all the time or what my hands put, are put to, I mean, however we, we, we unpack that, that maybe it's causing some problems and we have to reflect on that. Because if it's not in line, we need to cut it out. In other words, we need to get rid of it. We just need to get really aggressive with it. So I think that's a, an important step to greatness is considering. Last one, and I'll close with this is that greatness comes from receiving, from receiving. You know, and this one's kind of, again, I'm reading between the lines, but I think the greatness in the kingdom is, is with those who get into the kingdom. I mean, there's this idea, and I, and I purposely pull, put this one last, because I think all the things that we've talked about today, the turning, the becoming, the humbling, the welcoming, the encouraging, the considering, all find their meaning when I receive the kingdom, when I receive what God... See, being in opens the door for greatness. And the pathway to greatness in the kingdom starts when I receive the invitation to actually be a part of what God's doing. And I wonder for the disciples, as they ask this question, they're going, hey, who's the greatness? He's like, you know what? You should be maybe more focused on just being part of and in the kingdom. Receive that instead of worrying about this, this, or this, right? So I want to pray pray that God would open our eyes and redefine and redirect our thoughts that we might actually be in line with what he's saying. And maybe, maybe we could really step into to the goat idea, greatest of all time, which by the way, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's none of us, right? So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I, I thank you for the truth that God, you, you use our misunderstandings and our our motivations that maybe are out of whack to redirect and redefine our lives. And Lord, I pray that as we just studied a few scriptures and thoughts that you had presented, that Lord, we would be able to apply them and be changed by them. Lord, we need a move from heaven. We need something to happen in our lives. May we truly step into greatness because we've turned or because we've considered, we've welcomed, that we begin to do some of the things that we just talked about here today. Lord, let it not be something that comes and and we hear it and doesn't change us, but Lord, something that gets inside of us and becomes who we are. Lord, let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Hey, don't let's not stop here. You know, I think one of the phrases that Troy mentioned was that greatness is about impact, right? And so what is the what is happening in your life? What is what is going on in your life? What steps have you taken lately? towards Jesus and the greatest, right? The greatest of all time, the goat, right? What is it? What are you doing today? Maybe today you took the step to follow Jesus and commit your life to him. That's the greatest commitment you could ever make. The greatest step that you could ever make in your life is a step toward Jesus and committing your life to him. If you did that today, I want to encourage you to go out to southridgelife.com and fill out the little response card. There's a button at the top of the page that says response card. 
in there, we ask for some details and some information, I promise you, it, we're not gonna hunt you down. We're not gonna chase you down, but we wanna partner with you specifically in this decision. If you're a guest with us today and you're just kicking the tires, but you wanna find out more, I also want, I encourage you to go ahead and fill out that response card and check the appropriate information that you'd like to receive. We'd love to send that to you, to you and connect with you in that way as well. The other way of, of taking steps or connecting with Southridge is um, through our giving. So those of you who call Southridge home, you know we try and make it easy for you to give. You can text to give, you can text online. You know, tithes is all about one-tenth of your income. Tithe equals tenth. And that's what it's all about. And that helps us keep the lights on, right? It helps us keep this, this uh, stream going. It helps all of those types of things. And then we also have Kingdom Builders, which is above and beyond your tithe. We've had a lot of talk. We've been talking a lot about Kingdom Builders lately because it's the beginning of the year. We appreciate your commitment. If you haven't had a chance to make that commitment, and you want to, you can go out to, to the giving site and check that box and go ahead and commit to Kingdom Builders. Now next up is a step toward Jesus and pausing and listening and receiving what God is saying to you through worship. So we're going to take a few minutes. There's going to be some folks that are going to be singing in the background, but the whole point here is to step toward Jesus and just respond and accept or go after what he's talking to you about. So let's get, let's get on. Found in your name, power to save, with only a whisper, mountain shake, with Jesus our hope and strength. With every breath 
deserve it all. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all.
Hey Southridge, thank you so much for hanging out with us here online. And I wanna encourage you, if you're a guest or maybe you've been checking some things out, maybe you've, it's been a while since you've connected in person, We've got two campuses, one down in South Omaha area. We call it the New Hope Campus, and we have the one in Papillion, which is our main campus. Um, all of the details, addresses are out at southridgelife.com. But I want to encourage you to come and check us out. You know, we, we want to be wearing masks and do all those fun things as well. We're trying to be as safe as possible, uh, physically distant but socially connected. But I want to encourage you to connect with someone, connect in a life group or connect with us in person at one of our campuses. I, it is our prayer that you have a safe, fun week and that um, we all continue to take those steps closer to Jesus today. All right. Well, we'll see you next time.